chapter five is all about circular motion. So just a reminder, this is a chapter review. There is a whole bunch of stuff in here and it's really important, but I'm just kind of giving you the big ideas and we can practice some things. I may uh, show you, what because it's in this book, um, Kepler's Law, just one of them. Uh, but, so remember, this is John Batista's College Physics 5th Edition, Chapter 5, Circular Motion. So let's just look back at what we've done so far. The biggest things, number one is this, right? This is Newton's second law. This says, how do we deal with motion and forces? And this says that a force, a net force, so you have to add up all the forces, is equal to the mass times acceleration. And then we looked at some special forces, uh, the gravitational force on the surface of the Earth, the frictional force, the gravitational force, uh, real or better gravity for things that are further away. And then from that, we looked at kinematics. Uh, so we have the definition of average velocity. It's the change in position. Here we're using R for to locate position divided by the change in time. It's the rate of change of position, but it's average, right? So we can also write that if the velocity is actually changing, I can just, if the acceleration is constant, you can write this, otherwise you can't. It's the sum of the initial velocity at the beginning of some time interval plus the final velocity divided by two. You can do that. You can add them up and divide by two. And then we have the definition of acceleration. It's how fast the velocity changes. And these are vectors, right? So we can write these in X and Y directions. I could write this as AX is equal to delta VX over delta T. And then AY is delta VY over delta T. And we use that uh, in projectile motion. It's a special case, but still kinematics. Now, you can take this and this and this and combine them together and get this equation. This is one of the kinematic equations. This says that the final position, and I'm just using X, but it works for Y too, uh, is the initial position plus the initial velocity multiplied by how long you moved. A lot of times this will be just T because we'll do this uh, starting with t equals zero, plus one half a acceleration in the x direction times squared. And then this comes straight from this. The final velocity is the initial velocity plus a delta t. And then this is a special case. If you manipulate these two, you can get rid of time and you get the final velocity squared, initial velocity squared plus two acceleration change in position. Okay, I'm gonna do this a little bit out of order. We're talking about circular motion. So let's look at circular motion because there's something really awesome here. So imagine that I have an object with the velocity V1 and it's moving in a circle of radius R. And so after some short amount of time, it's going at a constant speed, and but it's now over here going that way V2. So these vectors are per or, uh, tangent to the circle, right? Because it's changing in direction. So it's over here. Well, remember that we define acceleration as the change in velocity with respect to time. So I can write that as V2 minus V1 over delta T. So if I want to do V1 minus V2, the vector sum of that, I could write it, I can, I can move these vectors around as long as they don't change their direction or their length. So if I rewrite them, I can put V1 right here. And V2 has the same length because the speed didn't change, but it's going at a different angle. It's like that. I'm gonna try to draw it correctly. And then we can say the change in velocity, delta V, is gonna be from the end of V1 to the end of V2. That's gonna be the direction of delta V. And so right there, we know something about the direction of the acceleration because if I take this delta V vector and divide by delta T, then A is gonna be in the same direction, right? Because we're dividing by a scalar. So that means that during this time, when the, when the object's moving from here to there, the acceleration is gonna be that way. So this is an important thing. We call this, uh, we actually call this centripetal acceleration. I'm going to write it out. And it, number one, points towards center 
of circle. Um, let's see. I don't let's see. Okay. Um, and this is really what centripetal means. Centripetal means center pointing. That's what that means. Now, don't confuse that with another word. Another word, centrifugal. Centrifugal means center fleeing, and I'll talk about that at the end. Okay, so this is important. It points toward the center of the circle. Now, can we, and if an object's accelerating, it doesn't have to do that. This, this is the only, the acceleration due to turning, so it's not changing speed. Can we find the magnitude of that acceleration? Well, yeah, we can. So it just takes a little bit of geometry to see that this angle theta and this angle theta are the same thing. So if I want, I could say delta V, if this is kind of, if, if I'm dealing over a short time interval, this is actually like the arc length, the arc length of a, of a circle, right? So if, if it's an arc length, then we'll get to arc length again in a little bit. I can say the magnitude of delta V is going to be equal to um, V, the magnitude of V times theta, right? Because if this is if this is a, an arc length like this, if this is R, and then that angle is theta, this length right here would be R theta. That's the arc length. Well, I have the same thing. I just don't have R. I have V. So delta V is V divided by theta. Now, I can also get an expression for the velocity based on this, right? So how far is this? Because it's going at a constant speed. I can say S equals R theta. And then I can say V is going to be the distance traveled, which is SR, it's going to be R theta, divided by delta T. Let's solve this for delta T. So delta T is going to be, ooh, delta T is going to be equal to R theta over V. Now I can use this and this to find the acceleration because the acceleration, we're just talking about the magnitude here. So the magnitude of the acceleration is going to be delta V over delta T. So I'm going to put in this for delta V, V theta. I'm going to put in this for delta T. So I get R theta divided by V. So the V goes up top. Theta cancels and I get V squared over R. So this is the other very important point. This is the magnitude of the acceleration for an object moving in a circle. Now just double check. If the velocity is in meters per second, I square that, I get meters squared per second squared, divided by meters. I do get meters per second squared, which is, which is a unit for acceleration. So the second point here, I have two points for centripetal acceleration. Number one, the direction of the vector acceleration is towards the center of the circle. Number two, it's v squared over r. And let's just think. So the faster you go, the greater the acceleration because v is on the top. The smaller the circle, which means tighter the turn, the greater the acceleration. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that's the most important thing in here. This, we call this centripetal acceleration, but it doesn't, you don't have to use that word ever. It's just if an object's moving in a circle, the, the magnitude of the acceleration is v squared over r, and the direction is toward the center of the circle. Okay, now let's talk about other circular motion because um, it is quite important. Um, so suppose I have, I'm going to trace my circle right there. Suppose I have an object moving in a circle. Well, one way I could describe its position is with the angle theta. So this is the distance r from the center of the circle, and that's theta. And like I said before, you know, imagine if I went all the way around the, the circle. So one circle. How far would that be? Well, that'd be the circumference, 2 pi r. But the angle is also 2 pi, right? The angle of a full circle in radians is 2 pi. So if I just go halfway, it'd be pi r. If I went a fourth of the way, it'd be pi over 2. And you can see that the angle matches up with that part. So I can put this, s equals r theta. And this just tells the distance I've traveled uh, in terms of the angu angular position. And theta must be in radians for this to work. Okay, so radians is really just a ratio anyway. Um, 
But if, if that's in meters and that's in meters and that's in radians, it works. If you do meters times degrees, it does not work. So how do you convert from degrees to radians? Uh, if theta is equal to 32 degrees, I can multiply by one, right? And so if I want to multiply by pi radians, and you don't have to put the radians there, divided by how, what's, what's the degree equivalent of just halfway around the circle? It's 180 degrees, the degrees cancel, and then I get the answer in radians. So that's how you can convert. And then if you want to go back, if you want to convert, theta equals, uh, let's say, 0 0.8 radians, then I can multiply by 180 degrees divided by uh, pi radians, and you don't have to write that radians, and the radians cancel, and you get the right answer. Okay, now let's look at velocity as some, the speed as something moves around the circle. So let's say V is going to be delta S delta T. Well, that's my, that's my delta. That's my S. So this is going to be delta R theta delta T. But it's in a circle. So R is constant. So I can actually pull it out and I get R delta theta delta t. And we have an expression for how fast the angle changes. And we call this the angular velocity delta theta over delta t. And this is the lowercase omega. I'm going to write it out. It's not a w. It's the Greek letter omega. Lowercase omega. Capital omega is that. Okay. That's lowercase omega. And this is normally, we like this to be in radians per second. It's how fast the angle changes, but it could be in units of uh, RPM, right, which is revolutions per minute. And so a lot of times we want this in radians per second, but that's another common unit that we could see there. Or you could have this in degrees per second. So you can have anything angle per time, but, but we really like this one. I really like this one. So you can see right here that just like up, up there, I can write V equals R omega. So I'm going to put it right here. V equals R omega. Oops, I cut that. That's fine. And this only works again. Oh, I use lowercase. I use be consistent. If omega is in radians per second. Because then I have radians per second times meters. gives me meters per second. So that works. Now we can do the same thing with the acceleration in that direction is going to be delta V delta T, but uh, V is, I already said, was equal to R delta omega, the R is cancel, the R is constant delta T. And so we call this delta omega delta T the angular acceleration uh, alpha as delta omega delta T. And so we get the following expression also, uh, A is r alpha. Okay, so this is the acceleration of the change in speed. This is not the, this is not the angular acceleration. I mean the centripetal acceleration. It's the acceleration of something moving faster and faster in a circle. Okay. But since this theta, omega, alpha look just like uh, x, v, and uh, and a, then we, just like we did before with the kinematic equations for displacement, we can write the same kinematic equations for, um, for angulars, ang angles. So I can write this, theta 2 is theta 1 plus omega 1 delta t plus 1 half alpha delta t squared. So you're, that, that's just like, going back here, that's just like that, right? Except instead of position, I'm using angular position. Instead of velocity, I'm using angular velocity. Instead of acceleration, I'm using angular acceleration. Omega 2 is omega 1 plus alpha delta t. Again, omega, angular velocity, angular velocity, angular acceleration. And then finally, omega 2 squared, omega 1 squared plus 2 alpha delta theta. So the kinematic equations look just the same. Um, okay, a couple of other important points. Another way we like to describe the motion in a circle. Oh, let me do this. A, centripetal, is v squared over r, right? We already said that. Well, what if I use uh, v is omega r, and I put that in here, I get 
uh, omega squared r squared over r is equal to omega squared r. So that's another way to write the angular acceleration. If you know the angular velocity instead of the linear velocity, you can write it this way. Now, another uh, way that we look at circular motion is with the period and the frequency. So if what if I want to find the period, how long it takes to go around one circle? So we call that the period t. And so if I want, if I know the angular velocity, let's say omega is delta theta over delta t time, the delta t is the period. And if delta theta is 2 pi. So I can say omega is 2 pi over t, or t equals 2 pi over omega. And we can convert this to a frequency we can say the frequency is how many times it makes a completion every second, which is just one over the period. So one over the frequency is one is the period. So this is a, a good relationship right there. So that's in, the frequency is in hertz. So let's put this T is in seconds. Uh, omega is in radians per second. And the frequency is in one over seconds, which is equal to a hertz, one hertz. So sometimes we'll just describe things in terms of their period, and it's useful to be able to switch back and forth between those. Um, okay, let me look at just two. I'm going to look at one thing. I'm not going to do Kepler's laws because it's better as an example, uh, not as a summary thing. One of the things that does come up is this. This is a wheel. If the wheel's rolling, the velocity of the wheel of radius r, v equals r omega is true. Okay, that's the velocity at the center of the wheel. You know, the point of contact, if it's rolling without slipping, the point of contact uh, is at rest. And this is moving faster than the axle, but that's moving at the velocity v is r omega. So if you know, this is basically how your speedometer works, right? It measures the angular velocity of your uh, axle and it assumes you have the correct size tires, then it can calculate your velocity. Okay, I think that's good. Um, like I said, I, I'd like to do some examples with circular motion. There's a whole bunch of great, there's a bunch of great stuff, especially if we use our ideas of, of uh, force equals mass and acceleration net force. Oh, I will say this. I said uh, centrifugal, centrip etal, it's pedal, actually one word. So this is what we use, center pointing. And this is center fleeing. So what is a center fleeing force? So this is, imagine that you're in a car There's the, the headlights, there's the grill, there's the, it's coming out, uh, there's you, right there. And so the car is coming out of the paper and it's turning this way. So this is the center of the circle that way. So you're, you're coming this way and you're turning that way. Uh, well, if you've been in a car and you've turned in a circle, you, you know that you get pushed out that way. And so that is uh, FC, the centrifugal force. But it's not what we'd call a real force. It's not due to an interaction between two things, just like we said before. The, the centrifugal force is a fake force that we put because we have a non-stationary reference frame. So if you're in the reference frame of the car and you want to try to make things work, you have to add that fake force. We're not going to deal with this in here because it just gets complicated. I'm pointing it out because it's very common for people to want to put that in there. Don't put that in there, okay? Forces are, con are an interaction between two things. If you don't know the other thing, then it's probably a fake force. And we can talk about fake forces more, um, but I just want to point it out uh, for in this summary. Okay, chapter five, summary. Hope that helps. The end.